Welcome to Radiology Case Review Ultrasound of Epidermal Inclusion Cyst, which is the most common cyst of the skin. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The fabulous images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. I'm going to show three interesting cases of epidermal inclusion cyst, highlighting key teaching points throughout. All right, so case one, this is a patient presenting with a left neck mask. So here we're starting with a high resolution linear transducer. This is a 14 megahertz transducer targeting the left lower neck. And you can see that there's an ovoid, slightly lobular, heterogeneously hypoechoic mass with posterior acoustic enhancement. It measures about two centimeters in size. And when we add power Doppler flow, we see that there's no internal vascularity. Even further, when we use microvascular flow imaging, or MV flow, which is great at detecting slow flow in small caliber vessels, we also see that there's no internal vascularity, but there is rather profound posterior acoustic enhancement. Now, let's switch to a higher frequency transducer. Here we're using a linear 18 megahertz transducer, and that gives us a better look at the internal architecture of this lesion, which is predominantly hypoechoic with areas of irregular mild hyperechogenicity and small dark anechoic areas as well. Now, if we turn sagittal, we again see it's ovoid. It has a broad contact with the skin. This is the subcutaneous fat and the underlying muscle, and it's well circumscribed. So this is typical for epidermal inclusion cyst. Now, there is another feature that these cysts can sometimes have, which adds specificity, and that's found in this case. This is a different patient presenting with a right upper back mass overlying the trapezius musculature. And you can see this is a larger mass, but otherwise it looks similar. It's heterogeneously hypoechoic. This one measures about four centimeters. Again, has a broad contact with the skin surface. There's the underlying musculature and post-acoustic enhancement. You can see this black area corresponds to the ultrasound gel. And again, we're using a 14 megahertz linear transducer. When we add Color Doppler imaging, there's no internal vascularity. Also none seen on power Doppler, which is a bit more sensitive than color. And turning sagittally, we again see the mass is well circumscribed. And we also notice that there's a small tubular hypoechoic tract extending to the skin surface. That's brought out a bit further when we turn transverse. You can see there's this little tract going to the skin surface. We've added more gel here to give us a better look at that area. And that's a great technique to look at small superficial structures is be really generous with the ultrasound gel. Now, sometimes real-time imaging better delineates the tract to the skin surface. Pay attention to this area here, and you can see that there's a small linear tract extending to the surface. Sometimes, again, that's better seen with ample ultrasound gel. And again, we see that heterogeneous internal contents of the cystic mass. When we turn sagittally, we see similar findings. Here's that tract to the skin surface representing a, a small channel. So let's look at key points for these two cases, which you can also find in the episode show notes. So as I mentioned earlier, the epidermal inclusion cyst is the most common cutaneous cyst, and it can occur anywhere. It can occur along the head, the neck, the trunk, or extremities. And these are benign cysts that contain keratin lined by a wall of stratified squamous epithelium. And peeling of keratin layers will accumulate inside the cyst, giving it the characteristic ultrasound appearance. And the ultrasound appearance is quite specific. Studies have shown it's 93 to 99% specific for the diagnosis of epidermal inclusion cysts. And typically, these lesions will present as well-circumscribed round to oval masses with a broad 50% contact with the dermis, as we saw in these cases. Now, the internal contents are predominantly hypoechoic to minimally hyperechoic, often with internal linear, echogenic, and anechoic debris. And that's been likened to the appearance of a testis on ultrasound, so you may hear the term pseudotestis used to describe these. Posteroacoustic enhancement is typical, as with other cystic lesions, and when these are uncomplicated, they tend to be non-vascular. And another feature that adds specificity to the diagnosis is the presence of a focal hypoechoic tract extending towards the epidermis, as we saw in case number two. That's sometimes referred to as the submarine sign. And you might see an overlying punctum on the skin surface correlating to that tract. And you can see that visually without the use of a transducer as a small dark colored opening on the skin surface. And then just some terminology. So these are not sebaceous cysts. Sebaceous cysts originate from sebaceous glands and contain sebum. These are actually uncommon and known as steatocystoma simplex. When they're multiple, it's often described as steatocystoma multiplex. Now, on the other hand, epidermal inclusion cysts contain keratin, not sebum. But despite that, these are often incorrectly referred to as sebaceous cysts. Now, what about epidermal inclusion cysts versus epidermoid cysts? Is there a difference? Well, an epidermoid cyst is a non-neoplastic cyst, which is lined only by squamous epithelium. And epidermal inclusion cyst is a specific type of epidermoid cyst caused by implantation of epidermal elements in the dermis. So all epidermal inclusion cysts are epidermoid cysts, but not all epidermoid cysts are epidermal inclusion cysts. 
So epidermoid cysts are typically described by anatomic location. So there are splenic epidermoid cysts. You may recall I did a video lecture previously on testicular epidermoid cysts. Those are different than these cysts, and you could just call them all generically epidermoid cysts, but these lesions in the skin are more specifically described as epidermal inclusion cysts. All right, let's look at the final case. So this patient presented with a draining soft tissue mass about the intercostal space of the left upper back. So scanning of that region, you can see we're looking with the transducer placed in transverse position. This is a rib. We have a similar appearing ovoid heterogeneous and hypoechoic cystic mass with postacoustic enhancement, broad abutment of the skin surface. But this is a little different. We're seeing some irregular contour to the lesion, as well as some increased heterogeneous echogenicity of the surrounding fat. And we're in the mid aspect of the lesion. If we move slightly superior, you could see just how irregular that contour is. So that's not typical for a normal epidermal inclusion cyst. Let's turn the transducer sagittally. We see this underlying rib. And again, an ovoid heterogeneous and hypochoic mass, but with irregular margins. Again, when we turn slightly off center, the irregularity of those margins is further defined and quite distinct. You can also see that there's a faint hypochoic tract extending to the skin surface here. When we look at this on real time imaging, the ill defined nature of the margins of this lesion are again demonstrated. And notice that heterogeneously echogenic surrounding fat indicating perilesional inflammatory change. Now, on this left hand image, we've added power Doppler flow, and note how there's some increased peripheral vascularity. That's different than the previous cases we looked at, right? And then adding microvascular flow imaging on this image, or MV flow, shows more pronounced vascular flow invaginating inward towards the center of the lesion. Also, some mild hyperemia in the surrounding echogenic perilesional fat, suggesting inflammation. And these are not findings we see with a non complicated epidermal inclusion cyst. This raises suspicion for cyst rupture or superinfection, and that's concordant with the findings that were found when this patient went to surgery. Now, for ruptured or infected epidermal inclusion cysts, the ultrasound appearance usually shows ill defined or lobular margins with internal blood flow. And as in this case, perilesional soft tissue inflammation appearing as adjacent focal fat hyperechogenicity or hyperemia. Now, uncomplicated epidermal inclusion cysts, since they're benign, typically don't require treatment, but if they become infected, they may require incision and drainage or ultimately excision. And anytime you see what looks like a cystic mass with internal blood flow, you have to consider, could this be a neoplasm, such as a neurogenic tumor? So that would be in the differential for a complicated epidermal inclusion cyst. And growing cysts may also require excision, not only because they may cause patient discomfort with increasing size, but because there is a rare 1% risk of malignant degeneration of these cysts, most commonly into squamous cell carcinoma, but also basal cell carcinoma. This is an excellent reference, the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound Consensus Conference Statement on the Ultrasound of Superficial Soft Tissue Masses by Dr. Jacobson, Middleton, Allison, et al. Outstanding resource. I highly recommend you take a look at that. And thank you so much for joining me. I hope you found this educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Spotify or Apple or by clicking the subscribe button on YouTube. It would be tremendous if you would consider leaving a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple. I also post interesting teaching files throughout the week that you can find by following us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit, or by clicking the YouTube community tab. Until next time, remember, radiology is life.